So you may not be aware of this, but this coming Wednesday, November 13th, is World Kindness Day. It's an annual celebration where uh, participants attempt to make the world a better place by celebrating and promoting good deeds and pledging acts of kindness, either as individuals or as organizations. And World Kindness Day was first launched in 1998 by the World Kindness Movement. It was an organization founded in 1997 in a Tokyo conference of like-minded organizations from around the world that met to discuss kindness. There are currently 28 nations involved in the World Kindness Movement, which is not affiliated with any religious or political movement. The mission of the World Kindness Movement, or World Kindness Day, is to create a kinder world by inspiring individuals towards greater kindness. So how should someone celebrate this day, November 13th? Some of the things people are encouraged to do are perform random acts of kindness, such as giving a kind word to someone. Smile at strangers and do kind things for them. Buy a coffee for someone. Volunteer time at the local soup kitchen. Leave a kind note for someone. And teach children the virtue of kindness by practicing it. World Kindness Day is not a national holiday, and it's a sad commentary that even such a day would be considered necessary in this day and age. Because in our world, we do see acts of kindness being performed, but we also see the tragedy of the other side. We see turmoil. We see wars. We see injustice. We see anger. We see strife. We see people tearing each other down. An us-versus-them mentality. We see anger. We see frustration. And if if we're honest with ourselves, we only see it escalating as time goes on. In fact, our society seems to be becoming less civil as time goes on. We're less civil with one another. The word civility comes from the word civilis, which in Latin means citizen. Merriam-Webster defines civility as civilized conduct, especially courtesy and politeness or a polite act or expression. The Institute for Civility and Government defines civility as follows. Civility is more about just politeness, though politeness is a necessary first step. It's about disagreeing without respect seeking common ground as a starting point for dialogue about differences, listening to past one's preoccupation, and teaching others to do the same. Civility is the hard work of staying present even with those whom we have deep-rooted and fierce disagreements. Incivility rather than civility appears to be the hallmark of our society. I would like to read from an article entitled America's Descent into Uncivil War, October 14, 2018, by John Horvath. When we say Americans are divided and polarized, it can conjure up the image of cloth stretched to the point of ripping. However, this image does not represent everything we are experiencing as a society. Indeed, the social fabric is already torn. The united America we once knew no longer exists. Instead, larger or smaller remnants are trying to survive inside a collapsing framework. Each clings to its rendition of the American dream and claims to be its authentic representative. The consensus that acted as a glue for holding America together is gone. In its stead, strident clashes between factions are the thunderous rumblings of worse things just over the horizon. The growing liberal hatred for Americans' Christian roots and morals means that we are no longer one nation under God. 
And the article goes on. Civil wars happen when there's a profound philosophical incompatibility inside a nation. Violence and war are the secondary effects of this cause and the later phases of its development. We are now at a stage where we can no longer discern a political unity or even organized fragments that congeal and dissolve around political and cultural issues. It's far from any neat geographic or political divisions normally associated with civil wars. What is at stake is fundamental. Nations are formed around unifying principles to which citizens must give their assent, at least implicitly. America's unifying principles no longer unify. Our society appears to be spiraling down the road to incivility. The question I have for us, and each and every one of us, has it impacted us? Has it impacted our thinking? Has it maybe impacted our actions? Has it impacted our view of others who think like us and maybe don't think like us? Only we can individually answer that question. I thought it would be prudent for the message today that I would explore the concept of civility in the Bible. And for those who like a title, it is Being Civil Amid Incivility. Being Civil Amid Incivility. Now, in exploring this concept, we won't find the term civil or incivility discussed in the King James Bible. However, we can see the concept of civility discussed in our Bible. It's clearly there. In our role of being civil to all those who we interact with, whether it's in society, whether it's at church, or whether it's with our family. However, to set the stage, I think it would be appropriate to examine verses that relate to incivility and God's view of them. Turn to Galatians 5, verse 19. Galatians 5, verse 19. Galatians 5, verse 19. Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, evil, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the times past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are seven particular words or phrases within the scripture I would like to explore that relate to incivility. They are first, hatred. William Barclay in his daily study Bible notes that the term hatred used in this context is the idea is of a man who is characteristically hostile to his fellow man. It is the precise opposite of the Christian virtue of love for brethren and all men. The second word is contentions. In the King James Version, the word is variance. And the Greek word for this is eris, which means wrangling, debate, strife. It is also referred to as rivalry. The third is outbursts of wrath or uncontrolled temper. The word Paul uses here means bursts of temper. It describes not anger which lasts, but angers which fla flames out and then dies. Selfish ambition. Another version used the word rivalries. The Greek word here is erythria, and it originally meant the work of a higher laborer. So it came to mean work done for pay. It went on to mean canvassing at a later time for political or public office. And it describes a person who wants an office 
not for any motives of service, but for what he or she can get out of it. Strong's Concordance notes that the word can also mean mercenary, self-seeking, acting for one's own gain, regardless of the discord or strife it causes. This person places self-interest ahead of what the Lord declares right or what is good for others. The fifth term I would like to explore with regard to incivility is dissensions. The Greek word literally means standing apart. It describes a society where members fly apart rather than come together. It's a society of schisms, of factions, of divisions. Sixth word I would like to look at is heresies. The usage of this term in the New Testament includes acts of taking and capturing, as in storming a city, choosing, a body of men who follow their own tenets or dissensions arising from diversity of opinion and aims. And finally, the seventh I would like to look at is envy. The simple definition of envy is to to want what belongs to someone else. A more thorough description of envy is a resentful, dissatisfied longing for another's possessions, position, fortune, achievements, or success. These works of the flesh, hatred, contentions, uncontrolled temper, rivalries, schisms, factions, dissensions, envy, relate to incivility. Do we see these traits, these works of the flesh, in our society today? And is it possible though it's not intended to, is it possible that these traits in society have impacted us? We live in the society. We work in it. We interact with it. Could it be our thoughts, our reactions are impacted by these works of the flesh? And these traits, traits that lead to incivility, are seen in the last days as well. Turn to 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. And I would like to read from the New Living Translation, if I may. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. It states, You should know this, Timothy, that with that in the last days there will become very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money they will be boastful and proud scoffing at God disobedient to their parents and ungrateful they will consider nothing sacred verse 3 they will be unloving and unforgiving they will slander others and have no self control they will be cruel And hate what is good. They will betray their friends. Be reckless. Be puffed up with pride. And love pleasures rather than God. They will act religious. But they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. We are not to be unloving. We are not to be unforgiving. We are not to be slandering others. We are to have self-control. We are not to be cruel. We should not be betraying friends. In many ways, these words reflect the incivility of society in the last days. And as Paul noted to Timothy, we are to stay away from people like that. We are as God's people, to walk a different walk. To begin our review of civility in this message, I believe it's important to review two verses that set the standard of our Christian life. Because the words in them serve as the basis of how we interact with others. Let's turn to 1 Peter 3, verse 8. 1 Peter 3, verse 8. 1 Peter 3, verse 8. One 
1 Peter 3, verse 8. Finally, it states, and I'd like to read from uh, the English Standard Version, if I may. It states, 1 Peter 3, verse 8, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for this you for to this you were called that you may be, obtain a blessing we can look at these words and phrases for example unity of mind when thinking of this this phrase here we cannot help but think about the words jesus used when he prayed that his people that they might all be one as he and his father are one in john 17:21 to 23 with unity of mind, we are in line with God in our thinking, in our actions. Second, Peter uses the, third, the term sympathy. The Bible notes that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice, but we are also to weep with those who re weep in Romans 12, verse 15. When one member of the body suffers, all members suffer with it. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26. One thing is clear. Sympathy and selfishness do not coexist. Third point mentioned here is brotherly love. And we know that Jesus Christ gave a new commandment. That is that we love one another. And this is how all men will know that we are Christ's disciples. If we have love one to another. Fourth, we are to have a tender heart. As some versions state, we are to be compassionate. Compassion alludes to kindness and sympathy, but it's something far deeper, something even more profoundly meaningful. The origin of the word in Latin is compati, which means to suffer with. Compassion means someone else's heartbreak becomes our heartbreak. Another suffering becomes our suffering. True compassion changes the way we live. Next, the word humble. In our walk and life, we are to be humble. And it comes from the Latin humilis, which means low, to view ourselves as needy. Unity of mind with God and with each other. Being sympathetic. Demonstrating brotherly love being compassionate, being humble. This sets the stage for our walk in this world. Then, as verse 9 shows, we do not repay evil for evil. and We don't revile. A reviler is a person who uses words to damage, control, or insult someone's character or reputation. In modern language, we would call a reviler a verbal abuser. Reviler is a multi-purpose word that is used in the Bible to describe all manners of verbal sin, such as slander, angry outbursts, and foul language. Verse 9 also notes one other thing, that we are to bless, which literally means in the Greek to speak well of someone. And this word is often used in contrast to cursing. Thus, we live in a time where we must learn when and how to communicate without eliciting extreme or polarized reactions. We must learn to live civilly amongst incivility. But in keeping that in mind, we are not in charge of what others believe. However, when we treat others with love and respect, we participate in God's work of forming each of us more fully into the image of God. Now that we've briefly reviewed the traits of incivility and our basis for our Christian walk, we're ready to examine the concept of civility. Though we will not find the word civility in the King James Bible, the the Bible does encourage civility in our actions, in our speech, in our words. And we can see this in three ways. First, by being wise, using wise and 
informed speech. Secondly, using speech that edifies. And third, being respectful in our interactions. And I would like to explore each of these three ways the Bible encourages civility for this part of the message. So the first way the Bible encourages civility is by, be, by using wise and informed speech. By using wise and informed speech. The way one speaks is a repeated theme in scriptures. We know that in the book of James, chapter 3 is totally devoted to the power of the tongue. It's an important concept. Words have power. Words matter. Words can be encouraging or discouraging. They can be helpful or hurtful. They can be cruel or kind. And Proverbs affirms the value of applying the right word at the right moment. Let's turn to Proverbs 25, verse 11. Proverbs 25, verse 11. Proverbs 25, verse 11. Proverbs 25, verse 11, it states, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The biblical illustrator makes the following statement with regard to this verse. The term fitly is a very curious one in the original Hebrew. It signifies wheels. And the marginal reading is a word spoken on his wheels which means a word that rolled smoothly and pleasantly from the lips of the speakers to the ears of the hearer. In ancient times, the carts had no wheels, and most things were carried on horseback. There were no roads, and the carts were put on long shafts, and the two ends of which rested on the ground were dragged along by the horse with great difficulty, making deep, deep ruts into the ground. The first wheels that were used in our country were very clumsy and rough. Modern wheels are light and turn easy. The wise man says that each of your words should be like a vehicle on easy going wheels. So smooth and courteous that it would produce no jar or shock to either the speaker or the hearer. Not hurt by any harshness or roughness or leave a painful rut behind in the memory. Turn to Proverbs 17, verse 27. Proverbs 17, verse 27. Proverbs 17, verse 27. Proverbs 17, verse 27 states, He who has knowledge spares his words, and the man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Restraint in speech, both in content and in manner, is a mark of a member of God's family. A member of God's family understands how we say something can be as beneficial or harmful as what we say. The unrestrained person in either content or matter of speech is an example of someone without knowledge, without understanding. Proverbs 18, verse 2. Proverbs 18, verse 2. It states in Proverbs 18, verse 2, A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his his own heart. The New Living Translation renders this verse as follows. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. A mark of foolishness is to rush to judgment without being fully informed. A person with wisdom and understanding A person who practices civility delays speech and judgment until better informed. Turn 
turn to verse 7 of Proverbs 18. It states, A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. One rendition of the scripture I'd like to read as I prepared this message was as follows. A fool's lips walks into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. A A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. This proverb warns us that a fool who takes no pleasure in understanding, which we saw in Proverbs 18.2, receives a just recompense for his conduct, and that is destruction. How many times have we been guilty of jumping to conclusions without understanding the whole story and only to see the pain, the hurt, and the confusion as a result? James 1 verse 19 provides a concluding thought on this idea of using wise and informed speech in being civil to others. James 1 verse 19. James 1 verse 19. It states in James 1 verse 19, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. The second way the Bible encourages civility is through using speech that edifies. Speech that edifies. We live in a time where there's enjoyment related to tearing people down. From so-called reality TV to the coarse interactions on television or talk radio, there tends to be a continually and continuous display of putting people down, of criticizing, of tearing people down rather than building them up. And this misuse of words and actions can bring destruction spiritually, emotionally, and even physically. However, It should never be said of those who walk in the way of the members of God's family. To edify is defined as to instruct someone in the way that enlightens them, or to uplift morally, spiritually, or intellectually. Turn to Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Ephesians 4, verse 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Alan Barnes' note on the Bible makes the following statement with regard to this verse. But that which is good to the use of edified margin, to edify profitably, in the Greek, to useful edification, that is, adapt to instruct, counsel, and comfort others, to promote their intelligence. Speech is an invaluable gift, a blessing of inestimable worth. We may so speak as always to do good to others, we may give them some information which they may not have, impart some consolation which they need, elicit some truth by friendly discussion which we did not know before, or recall by friendly admonition those who are in danger of going astray. He who talks for the mere sake of talking will say many foolish things. He whose great aim in life is to benefit others will not be likely to say that which he will have occasion to regret. Romans 14, verse 19. Romans 14, verse 19. Romans 14, verse 19. It states in Romans 14, verse 19, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one one may edify another. It is interesting to note here that Paul links peace with edification, with building up. 
we have peace when we build each other up and we have the reverse effect when we tear each other down. And it's something we can see so plainly in our society today. And there are times when edifying is linked with using wisdom. We can see this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. First Corinthians 10, verse 23, it states, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. William Barclay makes the statement about this verse. So once again, out of an old and remote situation emerges a great truth. Many a thing that man may do with perfect safety as far as he himself is concerned, he must not do it it's going to be a stumbling block to someone else. There is nothing more real than Christian freedom, but Christian freedom must be used to help others and not to shock or to hurt them. A man has a duty to himself, but still a greater duty to others. Our words are to edify, build up, and not to be used for destructive purposes. The third way the Bible encourages civility is by being respectful in our interactions with others. By being respectful with our interactions with others. In the scriptures, respect is simply not nice things for certain people, but it's considered a Christian virtue. And we can see that in 1 Peter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. First Peter 3, verse 15. It states in First Peter 3, verse 15, But let your hearts honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for reason of the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. The premise here is our interactions with others are to be respectful, and gentle, as Bob Brown noted in his message regarding 1 Corinthians 15, 29. In going to chapter 2 and verse 17 of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 17 of 1 Peter, states, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. The New International Version translates, Honor all people as show proper respect. To everyone. The New Living Translation translates it as respect to everyone. William Barclay once again notes with regard to respecting everyone, states, To us, this may seem hardly needing to be said, but when Peter wrote this letter, it was really something quite new. There were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire, every one of whom was considered in law to be not a person, but a thing with no rights whatever. In effect, Peter was saying, remember the rights of the human personality, the dignity of every man. This does not mean we condone actions contrary to God's way of life, but it does mean we understand that all, all are created in the image of God. And with our interactions, we're always cognizant of the fact that people are made in the image of God. James 3, verse 8. James 3, verse 8. James 3, verse 8. It states in James 3, verse 8, But no man can tame the tongue, It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless God our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. The World English Bible in verse 9 translates this verse 9 as follows. With it we bless God our Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the image of God. James 3 verse 9 reminds us that we're all 
All, whether here in society, all are made in the image of God. And all our words and all our actions should reflect that reality. And we can see this with Paul when he was in Athens. Turn to Acts 17, verse 22. Acts 17, verse 22. Acts 17, verse 22. It states in Acts 17, verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this description to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Paul could have criticized, attacked, mocked, but through diplomatic discretion, steered and educated those who were in attendance. He called them very religious and used that as the basis of explaining the true God. He obviously didn't agree with the worship of idols. But he was respectful to the people. And with, it, with respect, he used the opportunity to edify those in attendance. Our conduct, our actions, our words are to be honorable. We are to be civil in our discourse with others. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. states in 1 Peter 2, verse 11, Behold, be, I mean, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. It's not only our speech, it's our conduct that is to be honorable to those around us. Treating people with civility is part of that conduct. Especially so, so would we understand that it states in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 20 that we are ambassadors for Christ. One thing ambassadors are always conscious of, the fact that they are the minority in the host country, as God's people are in this world. And they must be able to relate to many types of people. The ambassador must always be diplomatic, use tact, wisdom, and discretion to navigate in a foreign country. And as Christ's ambassadors, we must always be diplomatic, using tact, wisdom, discretion. We must always be civil. As ambassadors for Christ, we should not be going around offending people at will, even when we disagree with the way they're living their lives. If we look at Christ's example, the only people he strongly chastised were the people like the Pharisees who set them up as spiritual leaders and led people astray. Now at this time, I would like to play a brief TED Talk, thus the uh, behind me there. Uh, entitled Civility from Christine Porath, who is an associate professor of management at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. This message deals with incivility in the workplace, but it has a practical application in everyday life. I study the effects of incivility on people. What is incivility? It's disrespect or rudeness. It includes a lot of different behaviors, from mocking or belittling someone, to teasing people in ways that sting, to telling offensive jokes, to texting in meetings. So we launched a study on the effects of incivility on performance in the bottom line. And what we found was eye-opening. We sent a survey to business school alumni working in all different organizations. And we asked them to write a few sentences about one experience where they were treated rudely, disrespectfully, or insensitively. 
and to answer questions about how they reacted. One person told us about a boss that made insulting statements like, that's kindergartner's work. And another tore up someone's work in front of the entire team. And what we found is that incivility made people less motivated. 66% cut back work efforts. 80% lost time worrying about what happened. And 12% left their job. Cisco read about these numbers and estimated conservatively incivility was costing them $12 million a year. But what about if you're not the one who experiences it? What if you just see or hear it? In another study in a small group, we tested the effects of a peer insulting a group member. Now, what we found was really interesting because witnesses' performance decreased too, and not just marginally, quite significantly. Incivility is a bug. It's contagious, and we become carriers of it just by being around it. So if incivility has such a huge cost, why do we still see so much of it? The number one reason is stress. People feel overwhelmed. The other reason that people are not more civil, they believe they'll appear less leader-like. They wonder, do nice guys finish last? Well, it turns out in the long run, they don't. In a biotechnology firm, colleagues and I found that those that were seen as civil were twice as likely to be viewed as leaders, and they performed significantly better. Why does civility pay? Because people see you as an important and a powerful, unique combination of two key characteristics, warm and competent, friendly and smart. So where do you start? How can you lift people up and make people feel respected? Well, the nice thing is, it doesn't require a huge shift. Small things can make a big difference. I found that thanking people, sharing credit, listening attentively, humbly asking questions, acknowledging others, and smiling has an impact. What I know from my research is that when we have more civil environments, we're more productive, creative, helpful, happy, and healthy. We can do better. Each one of us can be more mindful and can take actions to lift others up around us, at work, at home, online, in schools, and in our communities. In every interaction, think, who do you want to be? Who do we want to be? Treating people with civility has positive impacts to us, to others, and to society. Now, treating people with civility doesn't mean we have to always agree with them or that we can't have a contrary view. But it also doesn't mean we have a passive view of things going on around us, avoiding issues for the sake of peace. Matthew 5, verse 9. Matthew 5, verse 9. Matthew 5, verse 9. It states in Matthew 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I would like to once again read from William Barclay. I used him a lot in this message, I realize, but... He had some good points to make, and he makes a good one here regarding Matthew 5, verse 9. It must carefully be noted what the beatitude is saying. The blessing is on peacemakers, not necessarily on the peace lovers. It very often happens that if a man loves peace in the wrong way, he succeeds in making trouble and not peace. We may, for instance, allow a threatening and dangerous situation to develop and our defense is that, for peace' sake, we don't want to take any action. There is many a person who thinks that he's loving peace when, in fact, he's piling up trouble for the future because he refuses to face the situation and take the action that the situation demands. The peace which the Bible calls blessed does not come from evasion of issues. It comes from facing them dealing with them, and conquering them. 
What, is this, what this beatitude demands is not the passive acceptance of things because we're afraid of the trouble of doing anything about them, but the act of facing of things and the making of peace, even when the way to peace is through struggle. Showing respect does not mean we refu- refuse to face a situation. Practicing civility doesn't mean we don't address matters. We are obligated to change things that are wrong, that do not line up with God's way of life. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. And I would like to read from the New International Version, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. It states in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. In our walk, we are to stand firm in the faith. We are to be courageous. Courageous. We are to be strong. And we do that with civility. We must strive to be civil and yet truthful. In effect, it is more than civility that we're called to practice. It's a term that is called convicted civility. Convicted civility. Religious scholar Martin Marty once stated, it is a fact of public life that when it comes to religion and politics, the committed lack civility and the civil often lacked conviction. What we need is convicted civility. The concept, having strong convictions and practicing civility is not easy, but it's essential if we're to show a different path to the world around us. It's part of our being a light. It's part of our being an ambassador for Christ. In the message today, we briefly reviewed the concept of civility in the Bible. We examine actions that are opposite, that contrast the concept of civility. Those are the works of the flesh, hostility, strife, uncontrolled temper, rivalry, schisms, division, envy. Indeed, in the last days, people will be unloving, will be slandering others, and have no self-control. Yet, We are called to a different walk. We are to be people of civility. And the Bible encourages civility in our actions, in our speech, in our words, in three ways. Using wise and informed speech. Using words and speech that edifies, that build up. And then we show respect to one another, even when we disagree with them. This is not only when major issues come up, but in our day-to-day actions. We can be more mindful. We can lift up people with our actions by being civil. The civility we show as members of God's family is convicted civility, being firm, being courageous, being strong, but we do it with wisdom, with gentleness, and with respect. I would like to conclude this message with an excerpt written by Duke Kwan in his article entitled, Whatever Happened to Civility? Civility is a moral commitment to fight the temptation to dehumanize those who disagree with us or mistreat us. It is important to note that civility is more than good manners or mere politeness. It's something far more robust. It must have the moral durability to weather opposition with poise and self-restraint. Neither is civility equivalent to passivity or silence. Jesus honored all, yet did not hold prophetic protest or rebuke when needed. He never did so, however, with ad hominem disdain. Civility is not the avoidance of unpleasant dialogue. Rather, civility is what makes unpleasant but constructive dialogue possible.